Right. Okay, so um, some of you might have come to the uh, the first webinar in this series, uh, the story of bees. Um, some of you may not, and that's not not a problem. Um, you don't need to have seen what's come before to understand what's happening today. Um, but I'm going to do a little bit of a recap of what we covered in the first talk, just to give a, a flavour of, of what we went through. Um, and then today I'm going to touch on uh, pollination. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about um, feeding uh, and then also provisioning and nesting as well. So we're looking at the sort of ecology of the bees today. Um, the only bit I won't be touching on is breeding. So that's probably the big sort of missing piece. Um, that's probably going to be a topic for another talk at some stage because that's both varied and, uh, and very interesting as well. But we're going to be focusing on, um, on the sort of nest provisioning and, and feeding aspect today. Um, so what did we learn last time? Well, we learned that essentially all bees are wasps, uh, but not all wasps are bees. So we went, we, we basically defined that, that bees are an offshoot of wasps. And, um, and so they're essentially vegetarian wasps uh, and they evolve to feed off of pollen um, rather than tissue. Um, and we also learned that uh, they're, the expansion and, and the evolution of bees is quite tied into um, the evolution of flowering plants, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, and that we believe that sort of happens somewhere in the late Cretaceous. Um, well, early to mid Cretaceous, really, um, and that this was the stage where we saw the transition um, from uh, meat eating from their ancestor, ancestral wasps along to uh, the vegetarian option, which is the pollen. We also looked at how the bees actually got to Australia in the first place. Um, so bees have populated Australia in waves over time. So they haven't, we didn't all just arrive in one go and they weren't there necessarily originally. So they actually made their first sort of jaunt to Australia via Antarctica. Um, back way in the Cretaceous when um, Antarctica was still connected to um, Australia and as it began to break apart there was enough of a land bridge there to allow the bees to move across that continent and up into Australia and then as time went on different lineages of bees um, came from Africa up through Asia and down back into Australia again so our oldest uh, bees that we have in Australia are our caleted bees which actually are our most numerous as well in terms of species and then things like our stingless bees they came a lot later uh, so actually, there's quite a big gulf in time between when those uh, two groups came. We also looked at just simply how amazingly diverse bees are, not just within Australia, but across the globe. Um, you know, going from tiny little couple of millimetre midgets right the way up to, um, to 40 millimetre giants. Uh, and we also looked at how their sociality is more like a continuum. You've got, we think of bees as either living in a hive or perhaps living on their own, but also there's lots of degrees of sociality along that spectrum. Um, and we looked into how different bees show different levels of social behavior. So at the, at the top end, you have things like the honeybee and the stingless bee as our highly eusocial groups. And then at the far end, you have our true solitary species where they just exist on their own and they don't cooperate with each other. So on to the actual topic of today. So we're going to talk about pollination, feeding and nesting. So these are all quite closely linked because it is um, essentially what the bee does while it's alive. And it's it's its primary objective is to uh, feed its offspring, create a nest and pass on its, its genes. And pollination occurs because of that, not it's in rather than as an intention um, from the bee. So a little bit about what pollination is. Most of you all, 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 all know that, but essentially it is the transfer of pollen from um, the male part of a flower to the female part of the flower. So essentially from the anther to the, to the stigma. Um, and when we talk about sort of cross-pollination, it's pollination between different individual flowers, um, but many species also have the ability to self-pollinate, so they, they can self-pollinate themselves. Or, and that can occur either through uh, a number of different means. It might occur via a bee, for example. So pollination vectors is just a sort of posh word, I suppose, for, um, for how pollen is transferred. 
so it's how it's transported from flower to flower. So we have um, sort of abiotic methods, so it might be wind, for example, or water. Uh, and of course, originally, before the evolution of flowering plants, that is the predominant way that um, that flowers, uh, that plants, sorry, would have reproduced. They would have used abiotic means. Um, whereas once the flowering plants came, we saw a huge explosion in the uh, the relationship between um, insects, particularly, and um, and plants. And so that biotic movement becomes the movement via animals. And it's not just insects, it can include mammals, it can include um, essentially anything that is an animal. Now, syndromes, um, it's essentially just the, the correlation between um, plant structures and pollinator structures and how that how they correlate with each other. And the strength of that correlation tells us how close they sort of co-evolved co over time. So this example here is a blue banded bee. Um, now a blue banded bee has a very, very long tongue. And in, so, in, so what it can do is it can access nectaries that are very in very, very deep flowers. And flowers evolve these type of uh, mechanisms to specifically exclude certain pollinators. They don't want everybody all and sundry coming in. They like to have these specific relationships. Um, and bees are arguably the animal group that has the closest sort of co-evolutionary relationship with flowering plants. Um, the huge explosion in diversification in both flowering plants and bees from the Cretaceous um, has just has fueled that. Uh, and you can see it in modern day with, um, you know, with the sheer number of, of plant, uh, flowering plants and, and bee species that we have. So floral wart rewards. This is obviously a critical part of the relationship between bees and flowers. Um, and it is the sole reason that bees go to flowers. So plants have evolved these rewards in order to entice um, animals to them um, with the intention of essentially getting them to, to uh, spread their pollen for them. Now, Nectar is the most obvious reward, and it's the one that we think of most when um, when we're talking about bees. But but actually, it's it's by no means the only one. Um, and one of the other chief rewards uh, is pollen. Now, pollen as a reward is a bit of a tricky one because unlike nectar, that is purely created as a reward. Um, of course, from a plant's perspective, the pollen is um, a reproductive gamete as well. It's not a um, it's not something they particularly want to hand up over. Um, and they're quite expensive to produce. So there's a little bit of sort of um, conflict there between what the bees are after and what the flower wants from it. Um, but also we do have a certain selection of flowers that produce floral oils. And there are bees that have evolved to harness these oils. So the little picture um, you see in the bottom there is a uh, Tenoplectra, which is the, as far as I'm aware, it's the only Australian um, oil collecting uh, bee. Um, and a lot of these plants produce the oils on their petals, and then the, uh, the bee gathers these oils together and uses them um, for, for nutrients. So not all pollination reaction uh, relationships are sort of um, equal. And I, mean, and, I, and I mean both in terms of contribution between plant and pollinator, but also comparing pollinators together. Um, so it's a relatively inefficient process, actually, pollination from um, by animals. Uh, you know, the, the vast majority of pollen never actually reaches its its intended destination. Um, but certain pollinators are a lot better than others. So I like to use the example of of the bees here because they're a really great um, image of, of how this efficiency can change. So if we think about um, a honeybee, for example, um, they're incredibly good at collecting pollen. So they're very, very good at it. Um, they pack it onto their, onto their legs um, and they are far less messy than some of their solitary uh, cousins. And so because of that, actually, they tend to transfer a little bit less pollen. Now, from the plant's perspective, of course, that's not ideal. The plant wants to have as much pollen reach another flower as possible. So actually, our solitary bees, pound for pound, are often better pollinators in that respect because they do tend to be messier. So if you see the little resin bee there in the bottom corner, um, she actually carries her pollen on her, on her abdomen, on the base of her abdomen, um, on hairs there, 
And actually that's quite a messy process and she just she tends to spill a lot of that. So that means from the plant's perspective, they get a better um, pollination outcome. Now, one of the sort of real specialities of bees, and not all bees do it, but, but it is something that bees are well known for, is, the, uh, is buzz pollination. Now, there's certain um, plants that are, have evolved to be very, very uh, stingy with their pollen in a way. So as we mentioned before, pollen is a, is a reproductive um, material and it's actually very expensive for the flowers to produce. So they don't want to be giving it away. So they lock their pollen away in special anthers called poricidal anthers. And these anthers only release their pollen when they're vibrated, specifically vibrated. Um, and bees have evolved, certain bees have evolved the ability to do this. So what they do is they come onto a flower, they land on it and they vibrate their flight muscles really, really uh, loudly. And you can hear them buzzing, hence the term buzz pollination. Um, and that causes the plant to release this pollen. So a classic case of this is actually tomatoes. So tomatoes require buzz pollination to get an effective fruit crop. Um, and so if you are growing tomatoes and you're in an area where you haven't got some of our native bees like teddy bear bees or blue banded bees or carpenter bees, these are all types of bee that sonicate or buzz pollinate as we will call it as well. If you haven't got those, you'll find you get a relatively poor um, tomato crop. And there's a few other plants that fit that bill as well. And many of our veggies that we grow in our gardens actually fit in that. So eggplant, for example, is another one. Um, so that's a really great example of, of the close evolutionary relationship between bees and flowers. You know, this, 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 these flowers have locked away their pollen and the bee is one of the only partners that, the, that is able to access that pollen effectively. And so you have this, this relationship between the two. Now, I've got a video of a buzz pollinating bee here. This is one of our little native bees, um, a solitary species. And I took this at our, our nursery. Uh, I'm hoping it's going to work. Unfortunately, it is on a weed. I do apologise for that. But I couldn't, I couldn't um, give up the chance to, uh, to film them doing it. So I hope you can hear that. So you can hear that high-pitched buzzing, I hope. So that's her vibrating her flight muscles and sending those vibrations into the anthers to release the pollen. And you can, you can also see quite how messy she is there, how there's sort of pollen on her legs, but it's also sort of stuck on her abdomen as well and, and all over the place. So that's an example of buzz pollination. If you get, a, if you get quite a large bee, like a, um, um, a, a green carpenter, for example, their buzz pollination is really loud because they're really quite a big, uh, big species. Um, but keep, a, keep an, an eye out for that um, when you're looking at native bees on, on plants. So let's talk about provisioning and feeding. Now, this is one of the most important ecological um, topics, really, for bees, because from a female's perspective, it's her entire life's work is to go out, provision her larva, pass on her genes, and then she'll pass away herself. And it is her primary purpose in life. So it's a really, really important um, part of, of bees ecology. And in order to understand it, it's worth sort of clarifying why bees actually visit flowers. So for, for many, we think about this sort of pollination relationship as, as a mutualism, right? This idea that they, they work sort of hand in glove. Um, but we must remember that bees and animals generally, um, they don't visit a flower to pollinate it. It's not their intention. There's no, um, there's no intent from them to go to a flower to pollinate it. They go to a flower because they, need, they want to feed. And that's either, in the bee's case, it's either nectar or pollen or you know, perhaps um, oils for some bees as well. So it's a foraging reaction uh, in a relationship, really. Pollination is almost a byproduct of that. So from a plant's perspective, they offer these rewards in terms of nectar and, and, and pollen with the hope that during that interaction, that bee will hopefully accidentally pass on some pollen to another member of their, their species. But it's not a, 
it's not a conscious um, uh, decision by the bee. The bee is going there to feed. So that's why it comes onto this. So um, I put there bees and plants, mutualism or mutual exploitation. So when it, you might have heard of things like evolutionary arms races where you have a predator and you have a prey and each one keeps adapting to sort of keep up with the other. Now, the relationship between bees and, and flowers is not it's not quite an evolutionary arms race, but neither is it a sort of friendly agreement either. Um, both is trying to exploit the other and it just so happens that in many situations that exploitation can be equal. But we can see in many relationships where that's not true. So, for example, a number of bees actually rob flowers. So we looked at the blue banded bee earlier and we said that it had a long tongue and it could access the nectaries in these deep flowers. Well, what if you've got a bee and you've got a short tongue? Well, you can cheat. So you might chew your way into the base of a flower and lick the nectar out, but you're not coming in contact with the pollen at all. So the flower is getting cheated there. But also it happens on the other side. If we think of orchids as the classic flower cheats, um, they trick a lot of pollinators into delivering their pollen without giving them anything in return at all. So think about the relationship between bees and plants as a mutual exploitation. And in the sense that if, if one can get the upper hand on the other, it probably will. Um, so yes, it seems like this sort of match made in heaven, but um, but there's a not a darker side perhaps, but um, but understanding that each one of them is out for themselves, and, and if if they can do that by manipulating the other, uh, then they will do. So we mentioned that the that the rewards can be exploited, and I mentioned the um, the example of. Um, of the deep flowers that can be robbed um, by, by bees. But that can also happen in other ways as well. So for example, uh, pollen can be robbed. So if, if there, we actually find that a lot of um, wind pollinated plants actually contribute to the nutrition of bees. Now these wind pollinated plants have no interest in the bees foraging their pollen because they're not insect pollinated. Um, and yet their pollen is still stolen essentially by the bees. So that's a good example of of how the bees are out for themselves, as are the plants. Now, the plants are not um, defenseless by any means. So they have evolved various structures to help protect their rewards against would-be robbers. They only want those rewards to be for the right, the right um, pollinator partners and not the wrong ones. And so that can be chemical defenses. So certain plants put uh, certain chemicals in their nectar um, and in their pollen, in fact, that protects that against um, different species. So there's examples of, of um, a bee species that uh, can consume a particular type of pollen but can't consume another type, but yet a very closely related bee species does it the other way around. So there's this sort of um, protection going on with the plants. And also they can have physical protections too. So pollen is remarkably varied in its structure and they can be incredibly spiny or spiky or greasy um, in ways to deter certain pollinators and to um, attract others. So let's look at the primary foods. Um, and the first one, and the most obvious one, I suppose, for anyone who's, um, uh, who thinks about bees in relation to uh, feeding and plants is, of course, nectar. So, Nectar is the primary source of carbohydrates and, and water um, for bees, and it is a high energy, um, sugary food. Uh, and so that is what fuels the incredibly energetic flight of bees. And it's also why they're constantly looking for it, because flight is an incredibly expensive um, form of, of mobility. Uh, and so the bees have to consume a lot of energy to keep those huge flight muscles that sit in their thorax um, going. Now, it's also, um, of course, the basis for honey that we know as one of the sort of uh, key rewards that bees offer us in a way for, um, uh, for, for human beings. Um, and it is often the most commonly offered floral reward. So most flowers tend to prioritize offering nectar as a reward because it's cheaper to produce. So it's less energetically costly 
um, and it means they're not sacrificing as much pollen. However, there are some flowers that only offer pollen as a reward. You know, so poppies, for example, are a, are a plant that only offers um, pollen as a reward. Now, pollen is the other major food stuff. Now we've, we've touched on nectar and nectar is uh, very much an adult skewed food stuff. So the adults are very much um, dominated by feeding on, on nectar. Um, whereas pollen is dominated more by, by the larva. So the adults do eat pollen. Um, we know that the consumption of pollen is critical for ovary development in adults. Um, but for larva, it is the overwhelming primary nutritional source. Um, and pollen is incredibly nutritionally valuable. It's full of proteins and lipids, um, and it's a very rich uh, um, vegetative material in fact it's the, the richest um, plant material in terms of nutrition that you can pretty much come across and it is critically important for um for for the bee larva and that's why you'll see bees gathering so much of it so you can see our little stingless bees there on the left and any of you who have got a hive will know um in the in the summertime and the springtime you'll see them come back with their little yellow orange or or even black little bundles on their legs um, and those are the foodstuffs that are going to raise the next generation. Um, and but what's interesting about pollen, as opposed to nectar as such, is it's incredibly variable in terms of its nutrient content. So nectar can vary in terms of its sort of sugar concentration, and, and bees do tend to prefer um, higher concentrated nectar uh, to dilute stuff. But pollen is such a more complex um, nutrient nutritional component, and it can vary hugely in the amount of protein that exists in it, it can vary hugely in the amount of fats that are in it as well. Um, and so that's quite a challenge for a bee, you know, how do you know what you're gathering is, um, is any good? And they're also very variable in structure and, and size as well. So pollens can be um, very, very tiny and smooth, or they can be very, very large and spiky. And so the tools that a bee needs to gather those different types of pollens is different. So certain bees will only gather certain types of pollen because they they are literally mechanically only able to do so, um, and other ones will be uh, less accessible to them. So how do they find it in the first place? Because that's that's part of it. You, you, you might want to have the food, you've got to get there, you've got to find it first. Well, bees have a superb set of senses, um, and they engage numerous senses to locate, um, assess, and then also remember the locations of valuable food resources. So if you look at the top picture there, this is the face of a carpenter bee, and you can see that its head is dominated by these really large eyes. Now, bees have excellent color vision. Um, they see in a slightly different spectrum to us. So they see in the ultraviolet spectrum, um, but they don't see in the red spectrum like we do. So, if you can imagine from a bee's perspective, looking at a flower could look much different to the way we see a flower, because if it has ultraviolet reflecting uh, scales on the petals, then that flower can look completely different to a bee. But its eyesight is very keen, and so it's able to pick out these colours and it's able to pick out these flowers in the, in the landscape. They've also got an incredibly strong olfactory sense. So their antennae on their head, they, they do function as a tactile um, sensory organ as well, but their primary purpose is olfactory and they can detect chemicals from that. So the odors that flowers produce are detected by the bees and that gives them a cue to know, ah, this flower is rewarding and I can go to this flower and it's what I want. And of course, I think what's really incredible is that you have these hundreds or thousands of different types of flowers all having quite different um, sort of bouquets, and yet the bee is able to determine between these, and it's able to know which ones it likes and which ones it doesn't. Um, one of the more interesting senses, and perhaps one that is um, as close to a super sense as, as it gets, is they're also able to detect the electrostatic charge of a flower. So, if any of you have ever had the hairs on the back of your neck stand on end or the hairs on your arm stand up, that's this sort of electrostatic charge that's being picked up by your hairs. But bees are, generally speaking, quite hairy, um, and they're able to detect changes in the electrostatic um, profile of a flower, and they're able to determine between those flowers. 
to a point that a flower that is rewarding has a particular type of electrostatic profile and the bees are able to detect that using their hairs on their body. From the plant's perspective, what's really interesting is as the plant selects a single flower's electrostatic charge can change depending on whether it is rewarding or not. So for example, if a, if a flower has successfully been pollinated, its electrostatic charge can change, which turns the bee off. So it's, it essentially says, I'm no longer offering a reward, you go to the next flower. So this is, this is sort of, you know, all happening, it's invisible, it's all happening um, in, in the background, but an inc the, the sensory um, maps they must have when they're traveling in the environment must be absolutely incredible. Um, and so they have a huge amount of sensory input um, and that's how they essentially find and locate these flowers. What's also amazing though is they build maps in their head. We were talking about a, a creature here that has a tiny little brain, you know, the size of a pinhead in many respects, and yet they're able to produce a map in their mind of where different floral resources are and return to those resources regularly, but also temporally as well. So they're able to know that those ones are in flower at this time and those ones are in flower at this time. And I think for a creature like that, we, you know, we think of ourselves as intelligent, we think of mammals perhaps as intelligent. To, for a creature like that to be able to map its environment so accurately and, and make the most of that ability by harvesting the, its food in the most efficient way, I think is, is really genuinely incredible. So when they get there, how do they get it out? Because it's not always just presented to them easily. Sometimes they have to work for their food. So bees, I, I th think of bees as a little bit like a Swiss army knife for foraging. So every single part of their body is adapted for accessing floral rewards from their head to their legs, their thorax, everything. So one of the things they do have is a highly modified mouth part, proboscis. Now you can see here, this is a, this is a picture of, of, uh, of the proboscis and you can see the central piece there is the glosser, the tongue. And you can see it's quite, it's got sort of little hairs on it um, and they use that to lap up um, nectar. And in some species, they also use it to manipulate um, uh, nesting secretions as well. And, but the, the proboscis is actually a very complex organ. It's made a number of moving parts um, and it enables bees to um, efficiently harvest nectar from flowers. And we also, and we've discussed before that you can have long or short tongues depending on the type of flowers that you are adapted to. Um, and they're able to tuck all of this sort of uh, mechanism away underneath their mandibles uh, and it's only when you actually extend it and see the full uh, sort of complexity of a process that you appreciate what a what an amazing organ it, it really is but beyond that they also have a sort of selection of rakes and combs and brushes that they use to move pollen around so you might see on a flower a bee sort of scrabbling you might see with its front leg sort of just wiping flower and then you might see it push down its body or across its legs and what it's doing is it's using the uh, very highly adapted branched hairs on its legs to sweep that pollen into the right place and so they tend to have um, areas on their body that they specialize in storing pollen so if we talk about our stingless bees they have what we call a cubicula which is the top image there it's a flattened part of the uh, of the hind leg and they stick the pollen to that. A lot of other bees have, you use a scoper, which is essentially a densely haired part of the body. The bottom image there is a scoper on the leg, but also you can have a scoper on, on, the, on the tummy of bees as well. And they pack the pollen into there and that's how they can, um, how they can store it. Now, I just wanna to touch on pollen structure as an aside a little bit, because it's an incredibly fascinating uh, biological construct and its variation it can only be believed if you if, when, when you see it. If any of you have had the chance to look at a pollen grain underneath a microscope, for example, um, they look completely science fiction. They can look like spaceships. They can, it, it's just absolutely crazy. 
Um, and so that huge amount of variation, so all this image here, these are all different types of pollen grains. So you can see that in just in sheer size, they're so varied. Some are pitted, some are spiky, some are smooth, some have got really deep furrows, some of them look like sugar puffs. Um, but there's a huge variation in pollen. And so if you imagine, if you sort of drill down into the micro scale of trying to pack this pollen together, you know, certain pollens are going to pack better with certain densities of hairs and some are not. So what we find is that bees that tend to focus on plants that have small pollen have very dense hairs because they need those hairs to be dense in order to pack the pollen on. Whereas Bees that focus on larger pollen grains tend to be more sparsely aired because they can catch that bigger pollen. Now, from a nutritional perspective, one of the interesting parts of pollen is that all the nutrition is held inside this case. Um, and the pollen grain wall, the exine, um, is incredibly strong. It's one of the strongest biological materials in the world. Um, we find intact pollen grains from rocks from dinosaur period. They're, they're, and we're not talking fossils, we're talking still genuine real pollen grains. That's how strong the outer casing of pollen can be. And we call it sporopollenin. Um, and in the literature, there's a little bit of sort of confusion about whether it's a carbohydrate or a lipid. Um, a chemist that I worked with was adamant it was a lipid, so I always refer to it as that. Uh, so don't shoot me if um, if someone else finds out that it's that's a, that it's a carbohydrate, but it's incredibly tough and powerful. And so I suppose what you think about that is, well, how do you get to the good stuff on the inside as well? So that comes to sort of, you know, how do they access it? So we've talked about um, using their forelimbs. They brush that pollen onto themselves. We have talked about the bees detecting charges on the flowers, but what's also interesting is that the bees themselves carry a charge and it's opposite to that of the pollen. So not only do their hairs hold the pollen, they quite literally stick to the pollen as well through, through charge. So they're able to pack this pollen on themselves and the pollen just sticks there. So that's the majority of bees. Now there are actually some who don't possess a corbicula or a scopa, so these hairs or these sort of flat plates. Um, and there are some that actually swallow the pollen and they store it in, in their crop, in their honey stomach, um, and then they regurgitate it when they get back to the nest. So that's sort of a, we, we think of that perhaps as a slightly more primitive version, but in many cases, it's actually been, um, the things like the hairs and the scoper have been lost through evolutionary time and they've gone back to, to swallowing the pollen instead. Um, so we talked about the pollen structure and how tough that outer casing can be. So I suppose one of the big questions is, well, how do you get the nutrients out? If you've got this incredibly strong polymer that, that, you, that doesn't even break down over millions of years, um, how do you get it out? Well, we know that um, when bees consume pollen and it passes through their gut, that the exine, the outer part of the pollen, comes out intact. So it doesn't get digested. But what the bees do is they make use of the pores in the pollen. So pollen has pores in to enable the, um, the material to get out in terms of in for, it, for, the, for, the, for it to work as essentially a, a plant sperm, right? So they rupture these pores and then essentially extract the nutrients from inside the exine that way. And they, they do that internally um, in their gut. But I suppose one of the questions I want you to think about, and it's not something we're gonna to answer today because we still don't really know, is how, if you can only access something sort of nutritional quality once you've consumed it, then how do you know it's any good in the first place? We talked about how varied pollen is in terms of, um, uh, in terms of its nutrient content. So, you know, you can have really sort of rubbish pollen in terms of poor nutrients and you can have very, very rich pollen. But we don't really know how bees assess the quality of pollen um, before they consume it, if, if indeed they do. So one of the one of the ideas, of course, especially for social bees that have this crossover in generations, is that there's this sort of feedback loop. So they the adults consume the pollen, they're able to then, once it's the nutrients that are absorbed, they're able to assess the quality of that um, of that pollen and then feedback. So they're able to then say, oh, that pollen wasn't very good. This one is, we'll get this one. But I want you to think about it a little bit more from a solitary bees perspective. 
where um, because also in a social bee, they're able to feed their larva often. So, for example, honeybees feed their larva continually. So they also get feedback from the nurses and from the larva themselves. But in other bees that never meet their offspring, they gather this, you know, this huge pile of food and give it to them. Um, how do they know it's any good? And that's still something that's a bit of a mystery. And it's still something that's sort of a hot research topic um, in bee biology. Right. So specialist or generalist. Um, so. Bees, broadly speaking, and there are exceptions, are fairly easygoing when it comes to nectar. They don't really mind where it comes from. They'll forage off a sort of relatively broad um, selection of flowers, some smaller selections and some much bigger ones. Pollen, however, they can be far more choosy. Um, so we have what we call polylecti, which is a bee that feeds off a wide array of flowers. So they utilize lots of different things. So a polylectic bee, for example, would be our stingless bees, they're polylectic. Um, our blue banded bees, our teddy bear bees. What about common species are polylectic? One of the other ones is um, oligolecti. So oligolecti is when you, as a bee, they're more specialized. So they focus on a specific group of plants, normally within a single family. Um, and in very extreme cases, um, we can go right to the far end of specialization and there are bees that only forage up a single flower. Um, now, we tend to see less of the specialists as so often because they're so tightly tied to the phenology of their flowers that they will only appear at the time that those flowers are around. Whereas our generalist bees tend to have a slightly longer activity period because they're able to forage off of lots, lots of different things. So food prep. Now, bees modify their food when they gather it. So it's not just about, um, they don't just take nectar and dump it in the nest, they do things to it. So they extract water from nectar and that's essentially what ends up going to make honey. Now, not all bees make honey in the way you might think of it. So in terms of, you know, this jar of honey, right? Um, but they do all produce a concentrated version of the nectar, so essentially a honey, but often it's just the odd droplet here or there if you're a solitary species. So for example, our stingless bees, they produce stored honey. You know, they, they pot it and you have these little pots of honey. Whereas our solitary species, they will concentrate the nectar and produce a honey droplet, and then they'll normally either consume that themselves or they'll mix it with pollen to feed to their offspring. And they do this by, by swallowing the nectar into an organ called the honey stomach, called the crop, and then they regurgitate that back into their mandibles to let air move through it. And the air evaporates away the water and you concentrate that mixture. And that's how you get honey. Now, unlike nectar, pollen is not directly manipulated in terms of the pollen grains themselves. Um, but they do mix the pollens together and they also mix them with secretions from their own body and also often with honey and nectar as well. So you'll find that what they'll do is they'll make soups or uh, sometimes balls of pollen, and that's how they'll um, they'll feed their offspring. And that sort of often doughy ball forms, pardon me, the all of the food for a growing um, larva in the majority of bee species. And these are ones that don't continually feed their offspring. So, for example, our stingless bees, they are all they all leave a big block of pollen and the, and the larva consumes it, and the vast majority of our solitary ones as well. So that brings us on to provisioning. So how do you, how do you feed your offspring, right? So the majority of our bee species, both in Australia and, and across the world, um, are mass provisioners. So we just talked about this idea of making a pollen soup or a pollen ball. Um, you make that ball, you put it in a cell, you lay an egg on it, you seal the cell away or, um, or just leave it as it is, and the larva eats that food and that's all the food it gets. However, some bee species feed their offspring progressively bit by bit and they monitor their development. So the honeybee is a classic example of that. So you can see in the bottom there, the nurse bees there dipping into the, um, into the cells and feeding the larva bit by bit. Whereas the top image there is a classic case of a cavity nesting bee um, where you can see the stripped partitions in the cells and the big piles of pollen there that they're gonna feed from. So the last bit of the talk um, is going to be about nesting. Um, now nesting, of course, is strongly linked to provisioning because nesting is where you lay your eggs and it's where you store your food. So it's a critical part of 
um, of the sort of relationship with, with foraging. Now, there's lots of, obviously we've talked about things like social bees and solitary bees. And so the way they create nests and, and the structure of those nests um, differs between them. So in highly social bees, um, we see these as sort of the epitome of the free form nest. You know, they, 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 they gather materials, they produce different materials and they create these elaborate um, hives. And you know, this, this is an image that we might think of when we think of a beehive, this is a Western honey beehive. And then if any of us who have got stingless bees, we might think of this hive box like this. But of course, the hive box is an artificial construction. So, you know, what, what's really going on um, inside these? So if we take just a selection of social bees, so we'll start with the honeybees. So you can see here, this is, a, this is actually a, a, a feral honeybee hive from Australia. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and you can see the elaborate uh, selection of combs. You can see how they come, they hang and they come in these layers, which allows air to move through that space and helps to, to uh, regulate the temperature. And you can see quite well there, those really perfect hexagonal um, cells that the bees have made. So they have created this nest. There's other than the treats attached to, they have, they have all, the whole nest is created by them um, as a piece of freestanding architecture. Now, if we go on to the stingless bees, it's a very similar case. Um, they have a, a box or a hollow if they're in, um, uh, in, in the wild, but within that, all the things that they create are from secretions from themselves, so for wax, but also resin that they have gathered from the environment. And they bring that together and they mix the resin and waxes in different ratios to produce different quality building materials. So you can see there the eggs at the top, they're made of very waxy, soft, um, material, whereas the darker resin that you can see, that's mixed with um, the wax and resin mixed together. And depending on how much you put in depends on how hard and strong uh, that material is. So there's a real there's a real engineering aspect to these. I think this is a fantastic um, example of, of, na of natural engineering. But this is the sort of the, uh, the hive that we're most used to seeing, this beautiful spiral from our uh, tetragonular carbon area hives that we have. Um, in Sydney. But not all stingless bees look like that. Um, so this is a hive of um, Tetragonia hocking's eye, a closely related species. But you can see here they lack that spiral. They just sort of have a sort of ball in the middle. And their, their egg cells are relatively sort of um, all over the shop and they just put them together. And there's a lot of variation. We have, you know, a relatively few number of stingless bee species here in Australia, but in the in the tropical Americas and, um, and Asia, there's a really wide array of species and they, the hives can differ quite a lot. Now, bumblebees are another social group, obviously not one that we get in Australia, unless we count the invasive uh, bovetails in Tasmania, um, but they are a, a well-known common social group and they have a much smaller, uh, sort of nest size. So when we're talking the honeybees, you know, we're talking tens of thousands of, of individuals. The stingless bees, we're looking at sort of maximum about 10. Um, and then the bumblebees are often between sort of 50 and maybe a few hundred. So they're much on the smaller scale. And this one actually here, this is um, this is from the, the UK. Uh, and you can see that these bumblebees um, on the Pascua and they've, they've made their nest in a pile of moss in a little grassy tussock. So it's quite exposed. Um, it doesn't have the safety of a hollow or anything like that. It's quite an exposed nest. And you can see it's quite amorphous. There's no real pattern to it. And that's very clear here. So this is a North American species of bumblebee. Um, and you can see that there's sort of, you can spot the honey pots here and there, and then you can, these paler colored things are the, um, are the brood cells. And there's not a lot of reason or rhyme to where they go. It's sort of this, you know, build it where you see it type of thing. So that shows that even within a, these highly social groups, you have the really regimented hives of the honeybee with these perfect hexagonal cells. You move down to the sort of stingless bees where you've got still got these sort of pots, but they they tend to cluster them in the same place. And you've got this centralized brood chamber. And then you come on to bumblebees where it's sort of, you know, a little bit all over the shop. But actually, they're the minority. So you can see from the graph there that less than 10% of all bee species are social. The overwhelming majority of them um, are solitary. And so that the nests that we've just looked at for the social bees don't apply to the solitary bees. Um, the solitary bee nests tend to be simpler, but they're also very varied as well. 
So the sort of ancestral state for bees is ground nesting. So when we think of our ancestral bees, and actually the vast majority of our Australian bees nest in the ground. Um, they dig burrows or they use existing burrows. And this is an archetypal example of a ground nest that you can see in the image there. So you've got this long tunnel uh, that the female has excavated. You've got this little sort of volcano at the top called Tumulus, and that's all the soil that she's dragged out and pushed out the top. Um, and then you have these sort of lateral brew chambers that come off it and they end in this sort of ovular um, egg chamber. And this is another example of it here. So you can see where you've got this tunnel and then you've got these branching chambers. Um, and within those, you have a sort of little egg chamber at the, at, the, at the bottom. Now, there can be a lot of variation within this. So some bees um, create individual cells within these tunnels and they partition them. Some just dump them all in the end. Um, so there's a lot of variation in the way the solitary bees um, build their nests and the tunnel structures can change quite a lot as well. So this is where you've got the image there, you can see you've got these lateral burrows that come off, but some of them just do little branches off of the main tunnel. So there are lots of differences, but we tend to group them together as these ground nesters. Now also, the vast majority of bees that nest in the ground apply some sort of waterproofing layer to the inside of, um, of their nest, which makes sense because if it's in the ground and it gets rained on, you don't want your eggs to drown. So, and one of the famous examples of that is um, our chelated bees, our cellophane bees, that quite literally produce a glandular secretion that is that mimics cellophane, and they wrap um, the cells in this cellophane, and it makes the whole nest watertight. Now, there's sort of slight changes in um, the ground nesting type. So the, the ground nest we've touched on at the moment have been in sort of horizontal soil, dig down, and then you have um, sort of chambers off there. But quite a few bees have adapted to nest in vertical um, soil, in cliff bases or stream banks or um, uh, termite nests. Or if any of you have had uh, got an older property with, with soft mortar, you might have also caught bees nesting in that. Um, so one of the, the, the classic case of these sort of vertical um, nesting bees are the blue banded and the teddy bear bee. Um, very common in Sydney, and they also excavate their own hole. So they, they dig it out and then they lay their, um, their eggs inside. I suppose a, not necessarily an evolution of that, but a, but a, um, uh, a derivation of, of this sort of tunnelling is where bees burrow into things other than soil. So the classic case of this will be the carpenter bees. And of course, they're named because they chisel out wood. Uh, hence, hence the carpenter. And they'll choose, tend to choose softer woods uh, or woods that have started to decay. Um, and you can see at the bottom there a, uh, a, a twig that has been hollowed out by a carpenter bee. Uh, and she's made little partitions out of the um, sawdust that she's chewed up. And she's used those to create the cells at the bottom. And the image at the top there is a great carpenter bee. Um, we don't get those here in Sydney, but um, if any of you have been to North New South Wales or or southern Queensland, you, you do get them up there, um, and they're our biggest bee, so they really do stand out um, when you see them. But the nest structure is still very similar to that of a ground nester. They create a tunnel and they have cells along, um, along this tunnel. So the next set group is, is the cavity nesters. So these are similar to the um, ground nesters or the sort of uh, the carpenter group in the sense that they still tend to create individual um, uh, cells with a, with a few exceptions, um, but they don't tend to dig the holes themselves. So they tend to use pre-existing uh, uh, cavities. So this might be uh, hollow plant stems, it might be wood borer holes, um, anything essentially. It could even be uh, sort of man-made construct. So I've found a number of times where resin bees have nested in the recessed screw holes of hose pipe boxes. And you can see the little ends that have been capped. Uh, I've even had them nest in hose pipe before. So they will utilize quite a varied uh, um, uh, cavity. And you can see in the top image there, you've actually got two different types of, of insect there. You've got the, the leaf cutter at the bottom where you can see the little rolled packets of leaves, but the top is a hunting wasp. Um, and you can see she's captured spiders, but she also creates these partitions. So you can see the similarity between the two groups there. Um, 
Now, these are also the ones that you're going to find in UV hotels. Uh, so they're most associated with them because, of course, that's where you tend to provide uh, open cavities and things like uh, mast bees and leaf cutter bees and resin bees uh, and on occasion reed bees as well. Um, they tend to be the primary uh, species that take up residence in, in bee hotels. So you can actually see in this image here that this is a little um, little uh, Aladapini bee and she has hollowed out this uh, pithy stem and you can see she's created these little uh, hollows uh, inside and then she's she's laid her eggs um, in those and you can see the little piles of pollen in there. And in, in certain um, uh, reed bees as well, they they do utilize pithy stems, they don't create cells and they actually raise their offspring collectively uh, inside this, these, uh, these hollowed out twigs. Lantana is a really popular nesting material for them. So if you ever spot them, they're often with lantana. Um, and their larvae are particularly interesting because they don't have individual cells. So they have these little hooks that they end up hooking themselves onto the walls of the, um, of the, of the nest. And, the mother actually feeds them progressively, unlike most solitary species. Now, I wanted to add this on because I think this just shows how ingenious certain bees can be. So we don't get these species in Australia. These are part of the Osmini group, but um, these bees utilize empty snail shells to build their nests. So you can see in the first image there, image 14, where um, she has crawled inside and she's created all of these little pockets where she's stored pollen and each one of those pockets has got a larva in. So it's, a, it's an incredible use of, of something that you just wouldn't think they would go for. Um, but they find these uh, empty snail shells and they tend to sort of hide them amidst uh, grass and sticks and twigs and then they build their, their nests inside. Now, freeform nesting, we mentioned freeform nesting earlier when we were talking about the social bees, and that's the epitome of freeform nesting. It's this idea of a self-supporting nest that doesn't require an external uh, scaffold to keep it in one piece. Um, and actually, a number of species that still utilize existing cavities also technically have freeform nests. So leaf cutters, for example, they do, they tend to use existing cavities and those cavities do tend to be the same sort of size as their cells, but they are able to support themselves without the help of a tube. So for example, I actually have a little leaf cutter that nests out in the, the front door of my house uh, and it nests in a hole in the brick and the hole is about five times the size of the cells and she just rests them on the floor. And you'll actually sometimes find leaf cutters that have just left them amidst grass or twigs. So they are able to support themselves. Same goes for that bottom image there. This is a, um, a particular type of bee that creates resin pots and it glues those resin pots to twigs. And then it lays, it puts food inside the pot, lays an egg on it and caps it all out of resin. So it's all a cell that it's created itself um, and it's self-supporting. Right, this is the last part of the talk now. I'm sure you'll be glad to hear. I've been talking a while now. Um, but these are what I call the alternative model, the cuckoos. So what if you don't want to make your own nest because it's a lot of work, it takes a lot of effort. Why bother, right? So, and that's exactly what the cuckoo bees do. So cuckoo bees don't make their own nest. They steal somebody else's. And what they do is they wait for a bee to be happily making its nest. And then when the mother leaves, the cuckoo bee sneaks in and lays its own egg on the provision that the mother has gathered. And then unwittingly, the, uh, the host bee comes back, seals the cell, moves on. The cuckoo bee's larva hatches before the host larva, and they tend to be larger and they tend to have quite strong mandibles. They then kill and consume the host larva, and then they eat the pollen inside. So in terms of, you know, saving effort, the cuckoo bees have got it dialed down. They don't do hardly any work at all. They just find a host uh, and they get them to do all the work for them. This species here is a, a sharp-tailed bee. Um, and they are a, they tend to parasitize uh, leaf cutter bees. 
So they will lay their eggs inside leaf cocoons, and then that will, uh, that will grow up inside there. And rather than leaf cuts coming out the, in the spring, it'll be a, uh, a sharp tail. This one here um, is uh, the domino, could be. Um, and these are parasites of blue banded bees and um, teddy bear bees. And this same for this one, this is the neon cuckoo bee. Um, and again, the checkered cuckoo bee. So these are all parasites of the blue banded and the teddy bear bee, and they're all quite common visitors to your gardens. So keep your eye out for these because they're very striking. Um, they're very uh, pretty. And if you are ever lucky enough to have some blue banded nests in your garden, keep an eye out for these because you might get lucky enough to watch one actually trick the blue banded bees and get inside their nest. Um, and, you know, as, as, uh, as cruel as it is in a way, you know, that they, they hijack this, this poor bee's nest, she's done all this work and laid all her eggs inside and then bees sneak in and lay their own eggs and, it, and they kill all the ones that are inside. Um, I do think it's an, it's, it's, it is ingenious um, and it's, a, it's an amazing uh, sort of natural phenomenon. Um, so that's all I'm going to cover today. Uh, I think, you know, we've been, I've been talking now for an hour, so I think that's a good, uh, good amount of time. Um, if any of you have got any questions, please put them in the Q&A uh, and I'm happy to answer any that I can, um, any that I can now. Here we go. Um, yeah, we're getting some questions now, Alex. Mm. So Lindy's going to read out the questions um, and then I'll answer them on here so you can all, all hear right. what the answers are. Okay, well, there's lots of thank yous and no doubt it was a fascinating presentation. Thanks very much, Alex. It was really, really good and that's um, represented in a lot of these um, comments. But um, Nina asked right at the beginning, do bees migrate if the right nectar or pollen isn't available? Um, um, so not really, no, because they are they're what we call central base foragers. So they will, when they, when they hatch, when they come out in the spring, they'll search for an appropriate nest site. And part of that is also having the appropriate um, food resources in that area. So they may travel a reasonable distance in order to find that. But once they're there, they're committed to that, to that location. So I suppose the only exception to that is um, things like the Western honeybee. They will abscond from a hive if, if the situation is not suitable and they're able to move very long distances. But the vast majority of bees are quite tied to their local area. And it, it's why they can be quite sensitive to, um, to degradation, because they're not just able to up sticks and move somewhere else. Mm. Um, Mark Ross Smith says, you mentioned that honey is used to feed offspring. What happens when we harvest the honey for ourselves? Mm. So primarily stored honey. So if we're talking about stingless bees or we're talking about um, the Western honeybee, stored honey is primarily for the adults. So it is a food store to get them through hard times. So, for example, over the winter, our stingless bees will be using their uh, honey stores to get themselves through. Now, they do sometimes mix a little bit of that with, um, with pollen to feed to the offspring, but pollen makes up the majority of that. So I suppose in terms of our impacts of harvesting honey, it's about doing it conscientiously. So, for example, if, you're, if someone wanted to harvest honey from a stingless beehive, um, it can be done and it can be done safely, but it's about choosing the right time to do it. So if we, if we remember that they need that honey to get through the hard times, we definitely don't want to be taking that honey out in midsummer or towards the end of summer when they're not going to have the time to replenish those levels. So I always advise anyone, if you are going to take honey, um, bear in mind that if they've had a hard season, they probably need it more than you do. But if, if, it's, if times have been good, then you could look to harvest in the spring 
because then they're going to have the rest of the spring and the rest of summer to top those levels back up again. Um, and so that way, you're less likely to do any harm um, to your hive. Um, Elsa says, brilliant. We enjoyed that so much, Alex. One question, uh, the bumblebees that we might see, e.g. in Britain, male or female? As a young person, I always presumed that because they were bigger, they were male. Uh, so, well, you'll see both. So you'll see males and females. Um, but the females tend to be the bigger ones. So if you see the big, the big bumblebees, that's normally the queen. So with bumblebees, they have a slightly different um, reproductive cycle than our other social species. So when we think about our stingless bees, it's like a perennial system. You know, there's always bees there. But in the bumblebee, it's not, that's not the case. So you have a bumblebee queen. When she's produced, she overwinters on her own and then with a big store of pollen, and then she forges her own hive in the spring. And then all of those workers tend to die off at the end of the season, as she does. And then her daughter will go and sort of hibernate through the winter and come out in the spring. So you don't have this perennial cycle. Um, so what it means is that those ones you see early in the season, they're almost always queens that have come out and they're looking for a nesting site. Um, the males are a similar size to the females in most cases, but in a number of bumblebees, they're actually different colours. So you might be mistaking them for a different species, but actually they've just got different coloration. So um, sometimes it can be uh, an extra coloured stripe or they're lacking a particular colour. Um, but the and the males will come out at a very specific time of the season. So males will come out late because they're only there to breed with the virgin females at the end of the season. So you won't tend to see many males in the spring. Okay. Um, we have uh, Chiquita saying that she has neon blue banded and domino cuckoos in her garden. Uh, she's also got teddy bear stingless and leaf cutters and she's wondering if they can live in harmony. Oh, of course. I mean, these, you know, these, these are all native species. I mean, I suppose it's how you want, you want to define harmony. I mean, you know, the, the blue banded bee certainly doesn't like the dominoes and the cuckoos stealing their nests, but that's part of nature. And that's that relationship has evolved over millions of years. So in terms of a harmonious um, ecological system, definitely. Yeah. OK, and Penn was asking, do cuckoo bees only target one type or, or multiple types? Of yeah, so they tend to be quite specialised. Mm -hmm. So you'll find that they have a very narrow host range. So we talked about the neon and the domino, the checkered. Their host range is very much blue banners and teddy bears. They don't go outside of those. <clears throat> Normally because they're adapted to take advantage of the way their host nests. And so if you've got a broad selection of hosts, it's difficult to adapt correctly because they might all do different things. So you tend to find that, um, pardon me, different cuckoos are specialized in different groups. Okay. Uh, Rosemary says, I found this utterly fascinating. Many thanks. I have stingless bees and have also seen some blue banded bees as well over the years. How do solitary bees find each other for mating? There's a really good question. Um, that could be the topic of another talk in its own right. But what they there's a couple of ways. So um, in many solitary bees, the males hatch first. And what they do is they patrol often nest sites because they know that the females are going to come out and look for a nest. So they'll find appropriate nest sites and they'll patrol them or they'll find um, good floral resources and they'll patrol those because they know that when the females come out, they're either going to be coming out of the nest so that and the males are waiting there for them or they're going to be going to look for flowers, in which case the males are going to try and find the best patch of flowers and spend all their time there waiting for the female to come. Okay. Um, and Mark, who asked about the honey earlier, says, um, thanks. Um, I was thinking more of honeybees that seem to deliver huge amounts of honey. Yeah, so we have to remember that honeybees aren't really natural anymore. They're a domesticated animal. So, um, you know, they've been domesticated by human beings for hundreds of years. So they don't really fit the same criteria as wild bees, we've literally bred them to overproduce honey. You know, in, in the same way that you know Frisian cattle produce far more milk than a natural bovine would, right? So, um, because we bred them for that purpose, the impact of harvesting honey from them is 
is very little because we've li we've quite literally selected their genetic lines to pro to overproduce honey. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and lots of thank yous and appreciation for your talk, Alex. And um, I think probably last one from Penn is if the season is good and bees produce excess honey, uh, then do they feed on the older honey first? Can they can they tell? Is there a use? Oh, really good eggs? question. Really yeah. good question. Um, So there is a ripening effect to honey. Um, and we do know that they certainly feed off of the older pollen first because pollen goes off over time. Honey's far more stable. So I don't 100% know whether, especially the stingless bees in particular, whether they do choose the older pots before the younger ones. Um, and I think it's hard to measure because they constantly reuse and refill the pots. So it, it, you might have a full pot, for example, and it gets broken open and, and consumed slightly, and then they add new stuff to it. So you, you can have a pot that might have been originally filled a long time ago, but over, the over time it had little bits taken out and then topped up again, little bits taken out and topped up again. So you're gonna get quite a mix. Um, I would say that's probably more prevalent in the pollen stores than it is in the honey stores. Mm. Fascinating. Um, I'll just uh, read this one up because it's actually, I think, that, that um, a lot of people think the same, that um, um, from Elsa, Peter and I are amazed at your extensive knowledge and we're lucky to have you here. And I will back that up there, Alex. Well, thank you very uh, much. <laughs> many thanks for a terrific couple of talks. Wonderful animals. That's Mark Ross Smith. Jenny, oh, Jen B, when you looked at some of the native beehives that didn't survive the heat wave and drought, what did you find? Uh, so various things. Um, so in terms of the heat wave, the most common cause is that you have mass larval die off. So often um, you, so for example, a hive could melt essentially. So, you know, the resin could reach a temperature that it, that it quite literally melts, but we rarely find that because normally the, the, the threshold temperature for, for the bees dying is, is far below the melting temperature of the resin. Um, what we often found was essentially um, derelict hives where the, uh, the brood had died because the brood is far more sensitive to temperature than the adults. So the adults were still all there, but they'd lost so much of the brood because it had died in the heat wave that there was no one there to replace them. So over time, it's similar, in, similar to the way that a, a hive can lose a queen and you have this sort of steady degradation in, um, uh, in numbers, that can happen. In extreme cases, you can almost have this sort of flash frozen image where the heat got so intense that it even killed the adults as well. And you, you open the hive and just find thousands of dead bees just sitting there because they quite literally got cooked um, uh, inside their hive. So yeah, it's quite distressing sometimes. Um, but, you know, it's, it's worth remembering that they are, they are adapted to the Australian environment. They evolved here, um, but in very extreme cases, you know, they, they, can, um, they can have trouble. And it's often to do with, you know, we have to think, well, you know, have we designed the hive right? And is, is that an issue? And did we have it in the right location? Because sometimes that's critical as well. Um, so it's not always the bee's fault. We have to also sort of think about how we are looking after them as well. Thanks very much, Alex. I think you've still got quite a lot of people online, but I think that's the end of the questions. Oh, Brilliant. no. Um, oh. Sorry, I was saying again, does this mean that we will lose bee species because of that? Uh, well, a whole species, I guess, not just... Yeah. Because of the temperatures? I, I think that's what she means. Yeah, yeah. quite possibly. So I, if, any, if any of you got the chance to see the talk a couple of weeks ago by Inez, um, who was a master's student doing some work with us, she talked about temperature tolerance in stingless bees. And um, what we find is that the upper limit of thermal tolerance is really quite rigid. So it doesn't matter whether you're a bee species that lives in the top end or you live down in Victoria where it's cooler, your upper limit is pretty much the same. The bottom limit, however, your cold tolerance is really variable. So I suppose the dangerous part of that is if we do start seeing significant warming, especially in the areas of Australia that are already quite hot 
then we genuinely could lose entire species from those areas because it just simply becomes too hot for those bees to exist. Um, and so we'll often, we, we might see um, territory shifts. So, you know, we might see bees that were originally living in the tropics of Queensland moving down to northern New South Wales and further south as the climate changes. Um, and we may see, yeah, it's quite possible we might see entire species go, especially specialised ones that are very, very locked into a specific biome. It's a very sad, mm. very sad um, uh, to contemplate, but it, but it certainly is possible. Perhaps we should end on a high note, Alex. What's uh, <laughs> what, what's some good news to end up? <laughs> I, think uh, I suppose <laughs> I suppose the good news is that you know we are as a nation moving forward with um, our intent. I think to do something about it, and I think um, you know I I see a lot of school students and a lot of younger people coming through now that are so switched on to this and so passionate about it that. You know, they 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 inspire me to do more, um, but also, you know, thinking about we're going to be leading this world in in good hands. And so, yes, it is a you can choose the bleak approach of looking at it, but I try to look at it as there's a lot of opportunity here for us to make real differences in the way we um, in the way we look after our our country um, and sort of perhaps thinking about it less of a, of a commodity and more of a privilege that we've got this beautiful continent that we live on. Um, and I think that is becoming, you know, a more popular view. And as that happens, I really hope that that will then uh, encourage more and more people to, to, to do the little things that, that can really make the difference to look after our, our environment. Mm. Well, and thank you very much on that note. I think we should wrap it up because everybody should be feeling much <laughs> warm and fuzzy after yeah, that. Yeah, a bit happier. Yeah. <laughs> much happier. <laughs> thank you very much. No, thank you all. Um, any other questions you think of later on down the track, feel free to uh, send me an email. So have a good evening uh, and I'm sure I'll see you again. Goodbye. Okay.